individuals. That means something different from that. Uh, but yeah, but model theory is kind of hard to, to talk about like this. So often there is lots of background definitions. So we will do lots of definitions in this talk. Uh, we'll try to make give lots of examples as well and uh, go slowly, but just stop me anytime you're stuck or just completely lost. And kind of try to do my best to make clear what, uh, what is really going on. So I will start slowly. I will define what a graph is. So I give a lot of examples, so this is one motivating example. So, so to talk about the graph, you need a binary relation. Okay, you work on some set, so maybe on this relation. And the axioms will just tell you where well, it's irreflexive and it's symmetric. Right, so for every x, not x and for every x and every y, x e y times x. Okay, so these are kind of very simple axioms because you're only quantifying over an element, you're not saying something about for every set something happens. And you only have a very finite part here, you don't have you don't have infinite conjunctions, infinite disjunctions, so these are called uh, first order axioms. Or sometimes they're called elementary. So that's where the elementary part uh, is. So, so a lot of theories would say the class of graphs is elementary. Just because it can be axiomatized with elementary first order axes. Uh, in fact, it's also finitely axiomatizable. I only wrote finitely many axioms. There are classes that are elementary, but you need infinitely many axioms to use them. So let me give you an example. Uh, the axioms of algebraic equals. It just means it's a field where every polynomial equation has a solution. So you will have the axioms of fields. I'm not going to write them. Uh, and okay, I'm also I'm always going to specify the language what you're using. So here you have the binary relation. There you have binary operations plus times and also fixed constants 0 and 1, and I think that's all we need for the field. So you have the axioms of the field, it's just finitely many axioms in this fashion. So for example, you would have one that says that for every x there exists y, x plus y equals 0, can be part of it, which is about more. Uh, and then, okay, you have to say something about characteristic 0, so that would be that 1 is not 0, 1 plus 1 is not 0, 1 plus 1 plus 1 is not 0, and so on. So you have infinitely many axioms to say that. Um, and you could, you could also write this with an infinite disjunction, but this would not make it elementary anymore. This is still elementary. Each of these axioms is first order. And I'm just listing infinitely many. And finally, I have to say every polynomial has a solution. So no matter what. So for each degree of the polynomial, I add an axiom that says for every Okay, 
Okay, so I just have to say it. Do you hear the button on your voice? So you want x0 all the way to x and j being the solution is for... Uh, oh, yeah, you're right. There it is. X. Yeah, I'm just looking at where you want to know the one that you want to Okay, so that's, that's just the x0. So for each n, I add an x0 like this. And to fix n, this x0 is elementary. It's just quantification over a few elements and then some So this is not finitely axiomatizable, but it's still elementary. Cool. So this is what model theorists classically study. Uh, there's nothing so elementary about it. I mean, it's not trivial. I mean, those classes are interesting model theory. Um, and they're pretty nice. Like they have some nice property. One of the nice properties they have is their compactness theorem. If you have a list of infinitely many axioms, and you know that each finite part of this list can be realized by some object, so for example, you have the axioms of groups plus some more axioms, and uh, with the axioms of graphs plus some more axioms, say, and you know that for every finite part there is some object realizing it, then there is a graph realizing the full thing. So every So I'm keeping this way exactly what I mean. It can be realized. Hopefully it's clear. Like there is some kind of set with the right operations on it that satisfy the axioms. Then just the T itself can be realized. Okay, remember this means I haven't written it anywhere. The first order means is the quantification only over elements in set. And only finite disjunctions and conjunctions. Only a finite formula, actually. Yeah. So if you have a set of axioms like this, then you have the compactness theorem. This can give you some nice non-trivial results. So for example, you could look at uh, let's say the theory of natural <coughs> numbers. So I don't know how much I should write about the theory of natural numbers. So let me write some Commutative on them, and there are the induction principle, those kind of things. Some kind of induction, but it doesn't matter, you don't need induction. Just say the operation of addition and times the natural numbers behave like you want. Uh, and then you could add um, something about some special constant x or some special constant c that's bigger than 1. In your language, just like I had some constant for some special constant for zero and one in the language of field, I'm adding this constant c and I'm listing some of the axioms of natural numbers, whatever you want, and then I have this set of axioms that said that c is bigger than every single natural number. 
And so every finite subset of T uh, is realized by you know, the natural numbers. Because if I take a finite subset of that, I only have finitely many of these axioms. So I can just take C to be you know, a big enough number so that all the finite many, many inequalities are satisfied. But so this means that by the compactness theorem, T is realized by something. So it's some object some set that will actually contain the original natural numbers plus some weird called non-standard natural number that's above everything. It will still satisfy all of the properties, or the first order properties of the natural numbers. So it's a very nice theorem. It has many nice consequences. So that's, that's why I'm giving this example. Uh, but we know in math that not every topological space is compact, and not everything you know, has this finite, finitary property. So some objects are not elementary at all. They cannot be axiomatized in this nice way. So some mathematical objects are not elementary. So let's look at a few examples. So one kind of natural example is what's called the locally finite groups. So there are groups so that every set that's finitely generated is finite. such things that are infinite, but still every sub finitely generated subgroup is finite. You could take some kind of direct sum of small groups and finite groups. Okay, so there are kind of natural mathematical objects that are studied in group theory. Kind of behave almost like finite groups, so we can generalize a lot of the theory of finite groups to them. But they're not elementary. And like, there's no possible <coughs> set of first order axioms that could axiomatize them. And you know, it's not easy to see, it's not easy to prove. Uh, the way you do it is actually you assume that there is some set of axioms and you cannot use the compactness theorem to construct. Uh, not locally finite group that still satisfies all the axioms. So there is the, the intuition why is that there is no way to express that a set is finite using just you know quantification over elements and finite disjunctions and conjunctions. Because well to say a set is finite, you have to say it has some size n, but then n is kind of part of your formula and you have infinitely many n. Um, however, it's expressible in the unitary logic, so let's see so. Let's see how we could still axiomatize it using something like first order axioms. So it's expressible in first order plus infinite conjunctions. So I'm 
just going to sketch one. It's not, it's not too bad with kind of long formula. Uh, okay, so you have to say that every subgroup is, every financially generated subgroup is finite. So you're going to say for every A0, for every A n, so for each n you have an asterisk like this. Uh, and you want to say the group generated <coughs> by A0 to A is finite. Okay, and how are you going to say that? Well, you're going to say either it has size 0 or size 1 or size 2 or size 3, and this is an infinite conjunction. So you're going to say you pick. The national number, um, and it's going to say the group generated by this is finite. Uh, okay, and how do you say this one? Uh, well, this one for a fixed n. Should be elementary, so. because you just write all the possible combination of a zero and a n. Oh, but there are many combinations, here. so it's not quite elementary. So, but you say, so how do you say group generated a zero to a n as size? There must exist different and many different elements that are equal to the full group. Right? So, so, so x zero should be equal to. If you look at, for example, a zero times a one, it should be equal to a zero to x zero, or it should be equal to x one, or this for all possible words, so I'm not writing but any possible combination of that. Continue, there might be infinitely many combinations, but in the end they all have to be equal to this. And this is just a bunch of infinite conjunctions. Okay, so somehow it's not completely hopeless. Uh, here is an example that's actually pretty hopeless. Class of well rings. Well, it's hopeless from my perspective, from the kind of perspective I want to study. So, what are well order rings? They are just linear orders that have, for each every subset, non empty subset has a distinct element. So, it turns out it's impossible to say. Every set S, so you're quantifying over sets, so you're not allowed to do that in first order, S not empty implies S has a least element. So this part would be first order, just saying S has a least element, you just say there exists X so that for every Y, X is less than Y. But this part is not because you're quantifying over every single set. So it's not for order, and actually you can show it's not even possible to axiomatize it with just a finite conjunction and disjunction. So you just need a quantification of your set. Okay. Um, note also that, so this kind of gives you some mathematically interesting examples that are not elementary, so this motivation for just studying them because not everything is compact, so why not study things that are not compact? However, if you do that, you will lose the compactness theorem. So compactness fails for non-elementary things. Uh, let's say for non, for even elementary <coughs> with infinite conjunctions.
right? So and, and the example for that would be you can if you take your previous example, you can write a sentence that says for every x, x equals to one or x equals to one plus one or x equals to one plus one plus one. So this this whole thing is one axiom because you're allowing infinite resolution. And then And then you write another axiom which says that um, and you have this constant c, so c is bigger than one, c is bigger than one plus one. So you have an axiom for each of these things. So this uh, this thing is not it's gonna be a counterexample to compactness because uh, the entire set of axioms is not consistent because you're saying that every single element of your structure should be one, one plus one or 1 plus 1 plus 1 and so on, but you have this special element C that doesn't satisfy this like, bigger than any single natural number. But every finite subset of this is consistent for the same reason. So this, this shows that you cannot expect a this big number. So it's not as nice, but it still wants to be. So I'm going to tell you a framework where it's possible to study this. Because at that point, it started being a bit, a bit ad hoc. Like, OK, you looked at those first order axioms. Fine, at least it satisfies compactness, which is nice. But then you're saying, well, what if I add infinite conjunction disjunctions? Well, I could make up some other addition to my logic. I could invent other quantifiers. Like, let's quantify. Let's not. Let's use something as a formal. Let's add a quantifier that says, uh, for ors, but uncountably, well, for uncountably many things, something happens, or for finitely many things, something happens. You could make up your own logic, and it's kind of uh, ad hoc why you should really consider logic with infinite conjunctions and disjunctions and not some other kind of logic. Also, uh, I'm told regular mathematicians don't really like logic. <laughs> like, you know, it's annoying to talk about sentences and make precise what is a formula, what is a language, and I, I you know, regular mathematicians don't really care what, like, how exactly you express the axioms of groups, and they, are they first order or not, who knows. It doesn't really matter, you just want to study the object, the class of objects that are groups, that there's a category of groups. So, so we're gonna look at some more semantic framework that don't really depend on formulas or to make sense of them. <coughs> and so, there is one I mentioned in my abstract called abstract elementary classes, which I can't even joke about. It's an abstract, abstract elementary class, I my abstract, but okay. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about them right now because the definition is kind of complicated and I want to introduce something first. So this will be later. I want to talk about a simpler framework, universal classes. So both were introduced, well, universal classes have a long history, but these ones were introduced by Sarah Chanel, which is a famous logician. Uh, and okay, universal classes. So what are universal classes? There are classes of structures um, satisfying some, some property. So the definition, and I'm going to tell you the definition first, and don't worry if you don't understand it, I will explain. Substructures and unions of. Uh, uh, so let me explain this 
one thing that it's done. So what does it mean? So first of all, what is a structure? A structure is something like a group or something like a vector space or something like any of the objects we've seen before. It's a set of A with operations and relations on it. So it's operations or functions For example, a graph A E. This is a graph. It consists of a set of vertices and then a relation on it. A group is a set of things and then an operation times on it. So field is a set of things with times and plus on it. And also zero and one, which you can see either as operations, just fitting out the same thing all the time, or as just special elements. That's what structures are. So, yeah. So, does the operation be finite? Yeah, it's finitary functions and finitary relations. So, the ART is always finite. So, for example, you couldn't say take the reals with like summation, infinite summation on it, but just the finite operations. So, binary or binary. <coughs> okay, so I've told you what the structure is. What is the next thing? Here, the same vocabulary. It just means I don't want to mix up graphs and groups in my thing. I don't want to mix up well orderings and fields. I want to have the same type of relations in each, in each structure. So, same. So, the vocabulary. I'm not going to make this precise because it's more words than it is words. Types of operations, relations, a structure. So if one of my structure in the class looks like this, all of the other structures also have to look like this. They have to be a set with some binary relation. They cannot be a set with a unary relation or a set with I don't know, some <coughs> three airy. Everything has to look the same from the point of view of just a vocabulary. I'm not saying anything about what the relations have to satisfy, just that it has to look the same. Same kind of relations. Same heredity and same number of relations. Okay, so so far I haven't said anything. I pretty much all the objects you can think of look like this. Close on the isomorphism, well, you can define a general notion of isomorphism. For graphs, graph A, E, and E, F, isomorphism, if I add my F, you can only give F is a projection, and uh, A is related to B, e, you can only give F of A related to F. And you can define this for any number of relations and functions. And it just, it just means that the isomorphism plays nice with the structure. So, so this is just saying if you have a group and then you take an isomorphic copy of it, you also have to take a structure. So again, it's kind of a non-trigality. Okay, substructures <coughs> may be more interesting. Um, so if you have some structure A with a bunch of operations, let's say relations one, two, so on, it's going to be a substructure of B. Corresponds to subgroups and suborder and subfield. So, for example, I must be equal to an I restricted to the same. So, I just mean F I intersects A to the power of the RT. Just restricted to A, you should give you the right thing. You cannot just change completely what the multiplication is. 
on, on the original group or order of graph or whatever. And for functions, you define it. Okay, so this is saying if I have a <coughs> class of group, and I take a, a group is in my class, I take a subgroup of it, it's inside. And union of chains, well, let's say A, E, I, A, I, E, I, or I, natural number or any you know, order is such that A, I, I is a substructure of A, J, A, J, or I less than J, and then you require There is a way to make sense of the union, basically by this coherence condition, it just means what you think. So the, <coughs> the underlying set would be the union of the union sets, and the relation will also be, also be the union. And if you think of it in terms of the groups, this just means that if you want to compute A times B in your union, you just go down to the to begin of i so that a and b are in the group g i, then you compute the operation there, it gives you the result in the universe. Okay, so, so let's see some examples. That's what it means to be the universal class. So this why it was three axioms. So let's see examples and non examples. So this looks pretty general, right? I mean, many class of objects you know look like this. Class of graphs, class of all graphs. It's a universal class. The subgraph of a graph is a graph, it's full of isomorphism, and everything is fine. Uh, let's figure in locally finite groups. Even though I told you that this is not an elementary class, it's still a universal class. Because it's close on the substructure. If you have a group for which every finitely generated subgroup is finite, it's not going to change if you look at substructure. And it's close on the reunion also because <coughs> you know, any finite set of a subset of a union is containing a previous element, and so on. So it's very finitely. So anything that is very finitely like this would be a universal class. There is a non-example that's kind of annoying. If you look at the class of algebraically closed fields, say of characteristic zero, this is not a universal class. Because it's not closed on the main on the substrate. Take say the complex number C would be in the class. It's an algebraic equals field. But then you take Q, well it's a subfield of C, but it's not algebraic equals. So it's not in the class. So it's not closed on the substructure. Uh, it's closed on the union though. Like unions of algebraic equals algebraic equals, but it's a finite group. So this one is elementary, but not universal. So both can happen. The universal not elementary or universal. Um, and then what orderings are not? Um, because so in this case they are closed on their substructure. Like if you take a subset of a well ordering, it's still going to be a well ordering because every sub finite, every non empty subset is still going to have a least element. But it's not going to be closed on the union because you could have something like this going on. So you could take the set minus n to infinity. Let's look at the integers starting at minus n. This is a well-ordering because it kind of looks like a natural number. It's 
for every fixed edge of well ordering, and then you take the union, this is going to give you the full integers, and it's not going to be a well ordering anymore. OK, so the problem with this ordering is it doesn't play nicely with the fact that you want it, the well ordering to be well ordering. You might want to say, well, uh, you know, the nice notion of suborder would be being an initial segment or something nice that you can extend in the right way, doesn't add an element to the back of the ordering, but that's not allowed by this. Okay, so, so that's nice. That still manages to encompass some non-elementary examples, but still there are elementary examples that are not encompassed by this. So if I draw a picture, uh, I mean, you can define what it means to be universal and elementary. And then Classes that are bigger than this, and you have also universal classes that need not be elementary in order. So um, we see that so called abstract elementary classes sit up here, generalized board. Uh, you might ask also why it's called a universal class. Um, so it's this one goes back to logic. If you remember, it has something to do with logic, the point being that it's a result of Darsky that k is a universal class. There is a logic characterization of it. So even though we never use anything about formulas or any nonsense like this, we can, we can bring it back. Uh, k is axiomatized. Exercise to do this with uh, locally finite groups, but it's kind of tedious and I'm going to do it. I think, yeah, the axiomatization I get, I get here is really the work. That's the, you can change it to the next step, and you get some. And it's true in general, there's a correspondence. So the universal comes from the universal quantifiers. So is it true? Yes, so that's a very good point. Uh, here you have this. So, in fact, let's see. If you give me any subset of the structure L, that's in your class, you can consider the intersection of all the sub all the structures of K containing L, and this will be in your class because. <coughs> Operation, so maybe A is not in the class because it's not closed under the multiplication. But if you close it under multiplication, every single other thing, well, it's going to get you a substructure of that. So since K is closed under the substructure, you get something that's in the class. And you can argue that it's the same thing as the intersection of everything. So it's the closure. Algebraically closed field also are closed under intersection. So there's kind of a bigger class of things that are closed under intersections, but still might not be universal. So I'm kind of giving a lot of definitions. You might wonder why I care, what are the nice results about it. At least for elementary classes, you have the compactness theorem. Here, there's some kind of compactness, but I don't want to present it. But I will state results later. I want to give kind of the frameworks first, and then I will talk about the model theory. So 
now I will make an attempt to define what those abstract dimension classes are. So the one example you can think have in mind is the algebraic closed groups. They are not universal because they are not closed on the substructure, there was a problem. So one thing you want to require is that, well maybe it's not closed on the substructure, but there is still some kind, if you give me a substructure, maybe it's not in your class, but you can kind of still close it to a thing that's still small enough, it's pretty small, and is in your class. So every subset can be closed to a structure of the class that has reasonable size. So that would be part of the answer. Also, I mentioned the problem with the ordering. For example, for well ordering, it was not really the right notion to look at substructure. There are other examples like this. So, an AC would actually have a different order. It's going to be a pair K with an ordering. I don't want to require it to be closed on the substructure or on the union chains in this sense. And before, less than or equal is a partial order on the class. And, and if M is a K subscript that is field of K, if M is a K substructure of M, then it would be a substructure in the sense. It might be something, it might be things that are uh, substructures but not case of It's not a stronger relation. And I will give examples of ordering. This ordering just has model theory, but it's not just some random thing that doesn't care about how the isomorphism type is. I mean, it doesn't care, that's the point it's, it has to respect isomorphisms. Okay, so. And then there are three axioms coherence, machine axiom. So, so far I just have a class with a reasonable ordering. I haven't said so much about what it looks like. Any of the classes we've seen is not right. Okay, coherence. I'm not going to explain much about why you might care about such a thing, but it says that the, the abstract ordering on the class plays pretty nice with the substructure relations too. So if you have this situation, so you have three models, and M1 is a K substructure of M2, and M0 is a K substructure of M1, uh, M2, then M0 is a K substructure of M2. So this one I'm not going to explain why we care about it. It's kind of, it comes out from some generalization or something. You can forget about it, I'm just listing it for completeness. Um, okay, the LST axiom is what I was trying to tell you at the beginning about this algebraic. 
directly close to your business. You want something like close under substructure, but it's too strong. But you want some closure, so this would say there exists a carry on that now. Then I can close A to kind of a nice case of structure of M that will not be too big. is not too big. You know, you could take M0 to be equal to M, and then this would not be interesting. So I want to require that the size of the universe of M0 is less than or equal to lambda. Okay, so I'll give examples later, but for now I'll just write the axiomat here, then we'll check that some examples satisfy it. The idea is you can close any set to a substructure. Uh, and then chain axioms is a replacement for being closed on the chain of substructure. So if you have an I I A, let's say I for a linear order. The, the thing with universal classes for natural numbers that I really wanted to put in the order right here. So this is this is increasing with respect to this strong substructure relation. Then I can take the union. of the chain, so this one is kind of technical again. So if n extends all the mi's, then n must extend in this uh, ordering sense the union. Okay, so that's a long definition. I don't expect you to just remember every single fine technical point. I just wanted to give it in full so you have an idea of what kind of thing we're looking at here. Let's look at examples. Okay, so like I said, this in a nutshell means every chain uh, has a least of a bound, and it's going to be the union of the chain. This says every set. Closed to a small So, for example, uh, if you take a universal class and you order it with just substructure, then this is a big set. Okay, so let me explain why. Actually, okay, all these axioms, the coherence is trivial because it's exact, this thing is exactly substructure, so it's just thinking about transitivity of substructure, it's kind of interesting. Okay, why is this axiom true for universal classes? Well, you can take the closure under the functions of that on that. So, and this is false. Take M0 to be equal to the closure. Think of M as a group, it has just one function. So 
So just close the group under this. And if you think about it, you, know, you cannot get too many more elements if you close something on the functions. You will get at most the size of m0 will be at most, I don't know, the size of the say, vocabulary. Okay. So you know, the number of functions you have times lf0, something like this. And I'm not explaining why, but basically, you know, you're only plugging finitely many things in your functions. So you only get, if you do one application of your functions, you will only get size of the vocabulary times the size of it. So let's say A is finite. If you do one application of your function, you only get size of function many things. If you do another application, after Aleph not many applications, you're closed already. So this is, this is where it comes from. So this means you can take that to be the size of the vocabulary. So I'm working with infinite cardinals here, and you know, probably some of you are not familiar, so familiar with them, but just think that like finite cardinals. You know, it's just, just think, you know, just think, you know, it's either the size of the real or but it's not. And there's a basic fact about infinite arithmetic that we use, and that's the only one that we use. That's why I wrote uh, casually times and then exchange it with plus because it doesn't matter. Oh, and so this is for the NST axiom. Why does it satisfy the chain? Just because this becomes very easy once you have such structure. So, so okay, so at least it learns universal classes. I'm not going to explain why, but it also generalizes elementary classes. So if A is elementary, you can ask what is the order you can put on things. The substructure doesn't work in the end for reasons I'm not going to explain. But then you can put still an ordering that's stronger. It's called an elementary substructure. Let's look at uh, algebraically closed fields. Then algebraically closed fields work also. Okay. Algebraically closed fields. Well, it's elementary, so according to this, it works. But you also give an explicit description. You can order it with substructure, and it should be an AC because algebraically closed fields are closed on their union of chains. And the only axiom that was problematic was this closure on your substructure thing. But for any, if you can take its algebraic closure, you can just close it on their solution of polynomials. And again, the algebraic closure is not going to be so big that you know, it's going to be the same size as the set plus so. so this is a calculation for the case. Um, what else? Oh, non-examples. Well ordering is not an example. I'm not fully going to explain why, because you would have to check that no ordering can possibly work for them. But let's see. Um, if I order them with well, substructure, subordering, we show we saw already it's not even a universal class because you have this behavior with the, uh, the minus n. So if you order it with substructure, you're not going to get an AC even either. But um, if you order one ordering by being an initial segment, then um, this is going to fail still because now it's closed under union of chains. Because um, to argue something, but 
as long as you don't grow this part and you only grow the upper part, it will be fine. But it's not going to satisfy this Lovenheim scholar Tarski business because, uh, let's see, why? Um, we just pick uh, increasing, increasing chain at first and it's not well. Yeah, you can pick some kind of final. Well, no, you can more than that. Yeah, like for example, if you have, this is going to use some theory of mode ordering that we saw in the theory, but basically, if you, if, if you do mode ordering, it's fine this one. Um, and if in your the statement of the in the statement of this downward dominance column, this dominance column Tarski thing, if you take A to be equal to singleton A and A uh, set here, well, you want uh, to close it on the substructure, but substructure means initial segment. So you need to pick up all the things that are before A, and there might be much too many of them. Like, there's no fixed bound on this number of things. Like, you can always pick up even ordering that has many, many things. So that's why like, here A is just a singleton. So the side of A is not going to contribute much what contributes is the weird definition of the order. So it cannot be an AC. Okay, so so I'm not defining this. And now I can try to tell you a little bit about the model theory and what questions are interested in working with those. So just think AC equal nice class of structures with a nice ordering. Um, I should say maybe more examples. You might wonder like what is, like, I haven't given you a real example of an AEC where the ordering is not substructure. So we can look at the class of groups, let's say immediate groups. So the beginner groups, okay. If you order it under substructure, it's gonna be an AC, right? But there are other orderings that people that study groups consider. So for example, there's this notion of a pure subgroup. It's already in G. So it's some kind of nice closure property of the group, and this is studied by people doing Abelian group theory. And you might want your group H, you know, you might not want to consider groups that are not nice, not nicely closed. That's why this can be interesting. And this is an AC also. It's kind of a finite tree property, so you can go through the argument. Okay, so now in the second part of the talk, the basic observation for all this is the basic observation is that if you take a vector space, if you take two vector spaces, you might ask, well, are they isomorphic? Under what conditions are they the same? So they must have the same size for a start. But you can show that if they have the same begin of size, then they are isomorphic. So, motivation. If you take one, B2, there are vector spaces over Q. So, I haven't shown this, but vector spaces are also examples of AC, it's actually the number three. So 
think vector spaces are irrational? I assume they have size lambda. Yeah, lambda means object. Lambda is uncountable. Okay, so maybe they have the size of the reals. You can actually see the reals as a vector space. Um, so what I'm saying is that then V1 would be as one infinite. There's only one subject. Let me prove why. It's kind of fancy, but it's a very nice argument. Um, well, the basic part we're using is that B is a basis for B is a V1. Let B is how we find B. Well, the basis has to generate your entire space. Yeah, so size of B, of B is going to be bounded by whatever B generates, the size of whatever B generates. So, so any span of the basis would consist of a bunch of rational numbers and then a bunch of elements of B, n of them, let's say. And n ranges over So what I'm saying is that the size, any element of B can be written as a span, as a linear combination of elements of the basis, a linear combination of basis such as this. So the size of B is bounded by the sum of all n of the size of B to the power n times the size of the rationals to the power n. Right, but what is this? Well, using the facts I wrote about just the cardinal arithmetic being very easy on the infinite sets, this is the sum. The sum of the rational is aleph naught, the power n is still aleph naught because you take the max n times. And the size of b, well, it could be finite, I guess, so you put in a more, one more aleph naught, and then if you trace it to the power n, it doesn't matter. Okay, and aleph naught times aleph naught, of course, is aleph naught. And then you sum this n times, so you're basically just taking aleph naught times this again, so this is just b. I'm assuming the vector space has infinite size. So I left out this big image. So, so this must be an equality, and therefore size of B must be the same. So the size of B times I left out equals B, which is lambda. So since lambda is uncountable, B must have size. Small, then it cannot generate enough elements to cover the vector space. Okay, but now that I have this, I'm done because I can let B1 and B2 be basis for B1 and B2 respectively. They must have size lambda. Projection between two bases, you can just extend it. So it's a nice argument because it shows that this theory of linear independence can help you figure out that there's a unique object in the class. And when you have a unique object, it's not because you understand it, you know what to study. You just study this one object. And so that's called categoricity. You say a class is categorical in a cardinal lambda if it has only one object of that size.
this language, vector spaces are categorical in every object. Purely no. Um, the same argument will tell you that algebraic closed fields are categorical. Transcendence basis in the theory of field, and then you have a replacement for the span as well. This is kind of a nice generalization of this. You also have this, and so people notice this. The I mean, you notice this much earlier in the 50s, but some logician looked at it in the 50s and said, oh, maybe it's true. So, algebraic close field are elementary classes, vector spaces are also elementary classes. So maybe it's true for all elementary classes. If you're categorical in some size, then you kind of have a uniform reason for it, some kind of basis theory, and then you category called everywhere. So, that's a lecture. If you have too many axioms, you might be able to. I mean, the statement of this says something. So if you have an elementary class and K is categorical somewhere, some uncountable cardinal. The idea is, if you have some class that has a single object of a big size, then it must be for some uniform, very nice reason, a like simple uniform reason, like the existence of a basis, and then you have a nice theory of belonging dependence, and you can understand the class very well. So this looks like a random question, but actually somebody could it in the 1960s. And the proof was very nice because it introduced lots of ideas that allowed you to kind of study the model theory of basically any categorical elementary class or any nice enough elementary class and develop a theory of linear independence and basis that expanded that of vector spaces to many, many other examples. So this has had a lot big impact on model theory and also outside of, of model theory, other fields of So of course, you might wonder, well, what's so special about elementary classes? Now I have introduced abstract elementary classes, the theory for that, so. So shall I conjecture? And this thing opens. It's conjecture in the 70s. It opens in the sense that the same is true for ACs. So every ABC category for I know, I know. Must be categorical in all high enough. Okay, I'm being vague about the high enough part. Here it meant uncountable, but no. It's AC is more complicated, so it's just high enough. So there is some threshold above which thing that matters. Uh, so this is open, there are thousands of pages of approximation, many by Shada, many by others. And so I want to just state the, one of the main results of my thesis, which is that this is true for universal classes. The proof 
loop is very long and complex, and again, it gets a lot of machinery from generalizing linear independence of vector spaces and all that stuff. So in fact, okay, this is kind of funny, so I will not say it. You can ask what is the high enough threshold in this case? So more precisely, So what is this crazy number here? Uh, it's a very big cardinal actually, and you can show it's close to optimal actually. Um, so, so for any cardinal you can define two to the power of something. This is just the finality of the power set. It's bigger than the size of the set. Uh, maybe I should write the plus because I have to explain it. So it's, it's like two times two is bigger. It's just easier to explain. Okay, and what is the best thing? For lambda cardinal. Bet sub lambda. Uh, well, it's a chain of tools. Chain of exponentiation like lambda. So it's kind of hard to explain exactly how you do it. You can do it for finite size, and for infinite size, you cannot take the supremum of these things, and then you keep going lambda many times. Okay, and so, so this is my tower of two is bigger than the tower of two. <laughs> uh, so then you take that of this two to the power, which is pretty big. This is the size of the vocabulary, so all the classes we looked at are countable ones, you just think it's an account. This is like the size of. Uh, every subset of the real, the set of subset of all the reals, this thing on the brackets, if this is countable, and then, okay, you take a tower of twos that long, and then you take another of two that long, and then you get this thing. And the joke is that it's actually pretty s small compared to other cardinals that uh, set theorists are interested in. So this is uh, small <laughs> compared to uh, what's called large cardinals. So for example, if you have a large cardinal kappa, kappa will be bigger than that of lambda for every lambda that you kappa. So it just dominates all of this lambda of two. And usually actually, there are many approximations to this conjecture in the field, and many approximations use actually those large cardinals. The threshold was the next large cardinal, whatever that means, above some size. So this is actually not just because you managed to get this thing, even though it's just really close to it. So four, very, very good. But these are casual things. They pop up pretty often, actually. Okay, so, okay, I had other things to say, but it's late already, and it's a good place to stop, so I'll stop. Other questions? Yes. Any questions? Uh, one question. Yeah. So what was the power of the That's so about not on this thing. Yeah, so this is two to the two to the two not many times. And you might wonder how do you make a not many twos? Well, this is just defined to be the supremum of what I'm asking about not of two to the two to the two times. I think typically this is defined so that you have an alef not if you start with it. So maybe I should say like in the end you have an alef not if you start with so, um, this is two to the two to the two to the alef not. It doesn't really matter once you go big, but if I do this with the I mean, army, so so yeah, so you take the continuum like the size of the reals, and then you add to that the size of the all the subsets of the reals. Size of the set of all subsets of the real, 
you have to deal with your size, so on. So they are all strictly, this, this is an increasing chain of cardinals, right? And for any increasing chain of cardinals, that's set size, you can take its freedom, and this is something. So this is like the size of any set that uh, normal mathematicians might care about is bounded by this. And maybe you can look at functions from real to real, or all the different spaces of those functions or something. But we're never gonna get past two to the power two, past the finite swing of two, but if you do the power of that dot, then you go past it, but then you can take two to the power of that and continue. Define this as 